One of the items in the news that has certainly dominated uh, world news recently has been the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that threatens to embroil more nations as that war continues. Life Open Truth article, or the Life Open Truth article titled The Israeli-Palestinian Conflict, Will Peace Ever Come? Had this to say, I'll quote briefly from the article, horrific violence broke out yet again October 7th, 2023. The, you know, right there at the end of the feast, or during the feast, uh, we heard the announcement about that when Hamas terrorists attacked Israeli civilians at a music festival and in communities near Gaza. In the early days of this latest war, more than 1,000 Israelis and 1,000 Palestinians died. Hamas also took about 150 hostages into Gaza. That was the information we had at that time. European Union Chief Ursula von der Leyen told the European Commission Hamas terrorists killed women and children in their homes. They hunted, hunted hun hundreds of young men and women who were celebrating life and music. These innocents were killed for one single reason, for being Jewish and living in the state of Israel. It is an ancient evil which reminds us of the darkest past and shocks all of us to the core. That was in our Life, Hope, and Truth article about that event, quoted from the Times of Israel. Since that date, we know that thousands more have died in the conflict, and we've also seen numerous anti-Semitic and anti-Muslim events in our own country with hate for both Jews and Muslims raging um, in many nations around the world, and sadly, in our own country. Every year, an organization named Open Doors USA releases a World Watch report of the 50 countries most likely to punish Christians for their faith. And I want to read a few quotes from that report by the Cato Institute and Open Doors because as we see Jewish and Muslim sentiments and anti-Jewish and anti-Muslim sentiments raging, the world of Christianity kind of goes unnoticed as far as what's going on in the world around us. Again, this is a report titled, Christianity is the World's Most Persecuted Religion, confirms this report. This was March 7, 2022. The group Open Doors USA figures that 360 million Christians last year lived in countries where persecution was significant. Roughly 5,600 Christians were murdered, more than 6,000 detained or imprisoned, and another 4,000 plus kidnapped. In addition, more than 5,000 churches and other religious facilities were destroyed. And yet, that doesn't really make the news uh, for the most part. Every year, Open Doors USA releases its World Watch report of the 50 states' nations most likely to punish Christians for their faith. Last year, 11 of those were guilty of extreme persecution. I'll just read a few examples. Afghanistan took over the top spot, number one, from North Korea this year. Open Doors explains that it long was impossible to live openly as a Christian in Afghanistan. Leaving Islam is considered shameful, and Christian converts face dire consequences if their new faith is discovered. Either they have to flee the country, or they will be killed in Afghanistan. Number two on the list of the worst persecutors, last year's number one, North Korea. The Kim Dynasty created a personality cult that treats its members of the Kim Dynasty as semi-divine. Consequently, the North, the North, uh, Korea, uh, North Koreans view Christianity, which claims a higher loyalty, as particularly threatening because they consider their leaders to be divine. Uh, number three on the list, Somalia. Christians are viewed as high-value targets by Islamic radical groups. Even when Christian converts are not targeted by extremists, they are intensely pressured by their family and community. Next is Libya. When a person in Libya leaves Islam to follow Christ, they face immense pressure from their families to renounce their faith. Their neighbors and the rest of the community ostracizes them. 
You know, it's hard to put ourselves in their shoes, uh, and they can be left homeless, jobless, and alone. Targeted kidnappings and executions are always a possibility for believers in Libya. Eritrea is a viciously totalitarian state. Christian believers there continue to suffer extreme persecution, making one of the hardest places in the world to follow Christ. Another closely divided state is Nigeria, where Christians are explicitly targeted for their faith by Boko Haram. You've probably heard that a terrorist group and other extremists. Unfortunately, Christians receive little protection from the government. Persecution in Nigeria is simply put, brutally violent against Christians. Pakistan, con uh, Christians are considered second-class citizens, are discriminated against in every aspect of life, education, job, by family in Pakistan. Iran, number nine on the list, converts from Islam are most at risk of persecution, especially by the government. Also treating Christians and other religious minorities badly is India. India is notable for private violence against non-Hindus, increasingly promoted by the ruling party of Prime Minister Narendra Modi. The persecution of Christians in India has intensified as Hindu extremists aim to cleanse the country of their presence and of their influence to completely get rid of Christians. Rounding out the almost dirty dozen is Saudi Arabia. Did you know that Saudi Arabia former, continues to formally ban Christianity? And Christians are heavily restricted from sharing their faith or gathering for worship. And any actions outside of the norm can lead to detention and deportation. Finally, the article concludes by saying, according to Open Doors, another 39 countries are guilty of very high persecution. Christianity is the most persecuted faith in the world. Christianity the most persecuted faith in the world. It's a frightening article in a way, but also very eye-opening because we know that the scriptures say that persecution will come upon the righteous. And the Bible says the church of God at some point will face severe persecution beyond anything we've seen in our lifetime or in history. A type of persecution about anything that has ever happened before. It may come as persecution upon Christianity or as we look around us and see what's happening even right now in our country, it may come as anti-Semitic persecution because the Church of God to many appears to be Jewish to some degree, but the Bible does say that Satan-inspired persecution upon the Church of God is coming. We don't know when, may not be in our lifetime, may not be in the lifetime of our children, but it may be, or our grandchildren. We simply don't know. But the Bible says it is coming. So I thought I would, I would take time today. I mean, here we've just come from the feast, and the feast puts us in that joyous mood. And, you know, of course, we don't want to dispense with that. And Thanksgiving is coming up. We have so many blessings. But I thought it would be profitable to just... Think about the subject, what the Bible says about the subject of persecution. As we see what's going on in the world around us right now and watching the news, watching what's happening in our own country as well as many other countries, every day there are new news items about anti-Semitic events taking place. Um, and again, when will it begin to, in, in a way, uh, also attack Christianity to an even greater degree. Again, we know Satan will be at work. So what are some of our responsibilities now in the face of persecution we know is going to develop, even though it may not be in our lifetime? Do we have responsibilities now? Matthew 5.10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What should we do to prepare for that? How can we prepare for that? I want to take a few minutes first to review just specifically what the scriptures say about persecution. Because, you know, is the thought of persecution real to us? Could it really happen in my neighborhood, within my family, you know, in our city? Is that really possible? Uh, could it happen? Uh, conditions won't always be the way they are now. Some of you may remember some years back, Mr. Robert Armstrong exhorted the church to 
prepare to lower our standard of living, understanding that conditions wouldn't always be the same. And he targeted four particular areas to think about because conditions change. And we seem to be on the brink of some significant changes even as we watch events going on at this time. In Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to look at a few scriptures that specifically talk about persecution. Most of them are in the context of Christ's warnings to his disciples at that day, but they're also warnings to disciples of Christ through the ages. Those who choose to live the path of walking the Christian way of life. Christ exhorts his followers in Matthew 5, verse 11 and 12, where it says, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, lying about the people of God. Have lies ever been told about the church of God in the past? Well, there have been. Uh, but in the future, apparently, it's going to be much worse. <clears throat> Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So in history, historically, you know, those who follow the way of God, the prophets, were persecuted. Think of Jeremiah. And Christ said in, in his day, those who try to follow him would be persecuted. Many, at the end of the age, apparently, is, are going to be stirred up to anger and hatred against the church of God. That has happened before, and apparently will happen again. A few pages further in, Matthew 10. We read beginning in verse 16. Matthew 10, a warning to Christ's disciples, but it's a warning to all of us as well, if we choose, and as we have chosen, to live this way of life. Matthew 10, verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, Therefore be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We know where wisdom comes from. It comes from God. We certainly need that. But beware of men, it says, for they will deliver you up to the councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. It's an interesting statement. And we'll see more about that a little bit later. But here, a warning to Christ's disciples. It's a warning for us as well. Uh, verse 21 and 22. This is a frightening thought. Now, brother will deliver up brother to death. Could it be literal physical brothers or brothers in the church? Brother will deliver up brother to death and a father is child. Hard to imagine. And children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Is that really possible? And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. Are those things really possible? Could there be such extreme hatred of God's people that these things would happen? Verse 23. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. Well, there are examples in the Bible of our brothers and sisters, anciently, who had to do that very thing. Might we at some point? For surely I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. A disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, claiming he's demonic, claiming that Christ had a demon and you know, was demonic in what he said and taught and did, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. Whatever I tell you in the dark, speak in the light, and what you hear in the ear, preach on the housetops. So here a few instructions are found in these verses, and that is it may be necessary at some point to flee, if possible. Uh, some are fleeing even in our country, leaving certain communities or universities, or establishments because of the rise in anti-Semitic sentiment. But it also tells us here, don't be surprised when this kind of hatred rises against the church of God. It also says, don't fear. And we find here it says, be prepared to speak out with the truth of God. Be prepared to speak the truth. Again, it's hard to imagine these kind of things happening within 
our families, among our friends, it just doesn't seem possible. But, you know, there are some in the Church of God, historically, who can relate to these things very clearly because when they came into the church, they experienced the threats of violence and, in some cases, violence from family members who were very upset that they had come into the church. Um, as a pastor, I could tell you some stories of some of those that I've seen in the past and, you know, sat and witnessed extreme anger towards a mate by the other mate for coming into the church and threats of violence. We have those in the church of God today who recall those experiences and know how stirred up and angry uh, someone can get about what they have chosen to do in walking the Christian way of life. But the, the hatred and persecution as prophesied for the end of the age will be a Satan-inspired hatred, uh, stirring up anger against the church of God beyond normal human anger, as we read through a few of these examples. Verse 28, And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, as it says. Simply an indication that even a certain level of martyrdom may come, a certain you know, killing of Christians, as you know, those who profess the Christian faith in some countries have already you know, experienced that, uh, murder and death. Matthew chapter 24. Again, th these are not among my favorite scriptures in the Bible. Uh, the scriptures about persecution and what happens, what's going to happen at the end of the age, but yet they're here, and uh, we find that God wants us to be aware of them. Matthew 24, verse 3, when Christ was on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So specifically talking about the end of the age, Christ gave them a number of signs. Among those signs, beginning in verse 9, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations, not just in families and cities and friends, but by nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Here is an exhortation for the people of God today if we are living the end of the age. But at some point, Members of God's church can expect betrayal, hatred, persecution, some martyred. At some point in history, on the timeline as we advance toward the kingdom of God, at some point we can expect these things to take place. They're very sobering words of warning for the church today. Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21 and beginning in verse 12. Luke 21 Verse 12, there is this statement, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you. Now, this is again in the same context of events at the end of the age. They will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake, specifically because of what we teach about Christ and what we believe about living the Christian life is going to be something that becomes hated. Verse 16, you will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. By your patience, possess your souls. Some may die physically, but not eternal death. As the Revised Standard says, you will gain your lives. Some may die physically, but of course they can take away eternal life. A few more, John 15, as we advance through, John 15 and verses 18 and 19. Christ assured us of this. He said, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. Christ experienced hatred. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. I mean, we're so small. Why would people hate us? We're not a big group that's making you know, national and world news at this time. But you know, Satan stirs up anger and hatred against the church of God, as he's done in the past historically. 
Well, then it can rise to this level. 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4, verse 12 through about 14. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. If you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. For the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glorified. So there it talks about suffering for the sake of the truth, for the sake of Jesus Christ, being persecuted for that reason. And then finally, back up a little bit to 2 Timothy 3. There's this reminder, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy 3 and verse 12. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's a reminder to the people of God that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So again, what are some of our responsibilities now in the face of that? How do we prepare for that? We don't know who among us will be alive when, when these events, when that time comes, but what should we be doing to prepare as we know that that day is coming? I hope we'll see some answers in the example of one of our ancestors in the faith, I guess you would say, one of our, in this case, a brother in the faith who successfully preached the gospel and was persecuted for it. There are some tremendous lessons in his personal example of what he did in the face of persecution. As we read through the account, it's a challenge, but try to put yourself in his shoes. Try to put yourself there where he was and what he was experiencing. And we'll go to the book of Acts to begin. Acts chapter 17. Because there are some very powerful lessons that we can learn from his example as he went through this kind of persecution to a degree, realizing that it's going to be worse at the end of the age, whenever that time comes. But what he did and how he stood in the face of persecution has some very powerful lessons for us. Acts chapter 17, beginning in verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus whom I preach to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews who were not persuaded became envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace, and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and brought and sought to bring them out to the people. They thought Paul and Silas were there in Jason's house. Bring them out. We don't like what they're doing. They stirred up a mob, an angry mob. Again, we've seen a lot of that going on in recent weeks in our own country. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason, one of the brethren, you know, a brother in the faith, dragged him, out of his house, and some brethren dragged them to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. It's hard to imagine, you know, your door, let all knocking on your door, just you know, breaking down the door, dragging you out of your house and taking you before the city magistrates, before the, the court, before a judge. And they simply dragged them there. And verse 7 Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decree of Caesar, saying there is another king, Jesus. They accused Christians of subversive actions and what would be considered high treason, lies. They made up lies. Their, their claims, in this case, were not first about religion. 
Is that a pattern that could be repeated sometime in the future? Could that happen again? Verse 8, and they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. People who, you know, certainly inspired and moved by an evil spirit stirred up the whole city. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. What does that mean? They took security from Jason and the rest. They said, look, if you allow Paul and Silas into your home again, you're putting your home up for security. That is, you lose. You let them in again. You let them come again. We're taking your house. We're taking your property. They had to put up bonds, so to speak, to be let go, and that, and that was undoubtedly their property. That was the custom of the time. And you know, otherwise, they would lose everything if they housed Paul and Silas again, allowed the minister into their house. They would lose everything. Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. They had to flee. They had to leave and get out of town. When they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews there in Berea. And you know how the Bereans were. It says they were more fair-minded, verse 11, than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them believed, and also not a few of the Greeks, prominent women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica learned that the word of God was preached by Paul at Berea, they came there also and stirred up crowds. Then immediately the brethren sent Paul away to go to the sea. They had to flee again. But both Silas and Timothy remained there, so those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Paul was forced to leave. He had to flee because of persecution. Paul and Silas, I mean Silas and Timothy, better for them to leave too, which they did. In the next chapters, in chapter 18, 17, and 18, he's in Corinth. In chapter 19, they're in Ephesus. You may remember Paul's um, discussion or meeting with the Ephesian elders. Chapter 20, they're in Macedonia, other parts of Greece. We come to chapter 21. Chapter 21 of Acts, and so far we see Paul having to flee for teaching the truth because people were responding to it. And some people got very angry about that. Chapter 21 talks about Paul in Tyre and Caesarea and then going on to Jerusalem. We read in Acts 21 and verse 8, On the next day, we who were Paul's companions departed, came to Caesarea, and entered the house of Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven and stayed with him. So staying with brethren again. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. We don't know much about them other than they apparently had been given this gift. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit. So God inspire this. So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him, with Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. How did that affect Paul? Then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. It was always for the name of Christ, preaching Christ, preaching the truth about Jesus Christ, preaching what he preached, the kingdom of God. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, the will of the Lord be done, and after those days we packed up and they went off to Jerusalem. Paul went to Jerusalem. Despite the warning, despite what was said, he went anyway. And if we pick it up in Acts 21, verse 27. Now when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple in Jerusalem, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him. This time they got him. They laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! So this is you know, Jews persecuting Christians and stirring up the entire city, the entire town against Paul and others, laid hands on him, crying out, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place, the temple. 
Furthermore, he also brought Greeks, Gentiles, into the temple, which was, you know, forbidden and has defiled this holy place. They had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian, with him, with Paul in the city, whom they supposed that Paul had brought into the temple. And, of course, they made up a story. They made up a lie about this, stirred everybody up, and all the city was disturbed. It's hard to imagine. I don't know what the population of Jerusalem was at that time, but we're told that all the city, thousands of people, were disturbed by this. And the people ran together, seized Paul, and dragged him out of the temple, and immediately the doors were shut. It's hard to put ourselves in Paul's shoes at that point, but maybe you've been in a fight, I don't know. Maybe you've been in the middle of a mob that, you know, was pretty angry about something. You've seen a mob in action, been close enough. Here was a mob that dragged him out of the temple. Verse 31, now, as they were seeking to kill him, they had started some process of killing. News came to the commander of the garrison that all Jerusalem was in an uproar. Somebody called the police. He immediately took soldiers and centurions and ran down to them. And when they saw the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. They were beating him, this crowd, this mob, beating, kicking him. And the army came, the soldiers came, they stopped this. Then the commander came near and took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains. This guy must be a, a criminal of some kind for people to be so angry at him, put him in chains. And he asked who he was and what he had done. And some among the multitude cried one thing and some another. They made up stories, lies. So when he could not ascertain the truth because of the tumult, so many people yelling, shouting, you know, threatening, he commanded him to be taken to the barracks. When he reached the stairs, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the mob. He couldn't, they couldn't escort him through the mob just walking. They had to put him up on their shoulders and carry him through the mob for his own protection. Uh, maybe you saw this incident just the other day, uh, yesterday, I think, at the uh, Grand Central Station in New York City. Uh, a mob gathered outside, an anti-Semitic mob attacked Grand Central Station, began to try to break down the doors. There was a, a couple, a Jewish couple, happened to be walking by. Police had to kind of rush to their side and escort them because the mob was threatening them. Well, here's Paul. You know, he's, you know, what had he done? They made up stories and lies about him, had to carry him. For the multitude of the people followed after crying out away with him. The Jews were very disturbed by Paul. It's hard to imagine even worse persecution coming on the church of God than this, but the Bible seems to say that's exactly what will happen. Verse 37, Then as Paul was about to be led into the barracks, he said to the commander, May I speak to you? He replied, Can you speak Greek? Aren't you that Egyptian who some time ago stirred up a rebellion and led the 4,000 assassins out into the wilderness? Where did that come from? They said, Paul, you're, well, you're that, aren't you that Egyptian that had an army of 4,000 assassins? Somebody made up that story, and they said that was Paul. Well, you know, that would get people riled up. <laughs> what if people made up a story about you, you know, and just got people really angry and claimed you had done something that you were totally innocent of? And because they hated your religion, but since we at this time have freedom of religion in our country, uh, they might have to make up another story that was not of a religious nature to really stir people up. And here, this had nothing to do with religion. You're that Egyptian. You got a whole crew of assassins and you know, simply made up a story and a lie. But Paul said, I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city, and I implore you, permit me to speak to the people. So when he had given him permission, Paul stood on the stairs and motioned with his hand to the people, and when there was a great silence, I suppose, comparing the tumult that, and the mob yelling and shouting that had just been taking place, compared to that, there was great silence. And he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, saying. So what happens in Acts 22, Paul gives his defense before the people who had been trying to kill him. Basically what he does, he gives an overview of how he was called about how he was on the road to Damascus and what happened there and the miracle of God calling him and opening his mind 
to see the truth. He gives an account of how he was called and how he heard the voice, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he also, if we go down to verse 14 and 15, he talks about what God wanted him to do. Then he said, the God of our fathers has chosen you, Paul, that you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth, for you will be his witness to all men of what you have seen and heard. And now why are you waiting? Rise, be baptized, wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So Paul was given a commission. He just explained what had happened in his life and what he was doing, what he was trying to do, what his work was. And can we put ourselves in Paul's shoes? What can we learn from what Paul did here? Um, I think, well, let's read on in verse 17, because notice what happens. Now what happened, Paul was explaining, when I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple, I was in a trance, and saw him saying to me, make haste, get out of Jerusalem quickly, for they will not receive your testimony concerning me. So I said, Lord, they know that in every synagogue I imprison and beat those who believe in you. Paul himself was guilty of causing suffering on other Christians. And when the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by consenting to his death and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then he said to me, depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Paul said, this is my commission to be sent to the Gentiles. When they heard that, verse 22, they raised their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, I mean, they were so angry, just tore off their clothes and began throwing dust. It was a, a way, again, of expressing their anger. But you have to wonder what kind of spirit influence was there to cause them to do this, to be that angry. But here is Paul giving an account of his mission and his work. I think it's an example, something, a lesson for us to keep in mind, that, you know, we're not just here, you know, we're not just going to church, we're not just a member of the Church of God, we're doing a work. This church that we're part of has a work to do. And I think it's something we have to remind ourselves continually that we're part of a, the bigger picture is the work of preaching the gospel to the world and sharing what we have with others. And it's something for our children to understand, the bigger picture. We're not just here to come to church on Saturday, but we're part of something bigger. We're part of the work of God. Paul explained he was doing a work. Verse 24, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging. They were going to torture him to find out what's the truth so that he might know why they shouted so against him. How could they be so angry? And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? That was the magic word. As soon as they learned he was a Roman, there were laws against treating a Roman this way, a Roman citizen. A Roman citizen had rights. They had violated those rights. They could already be executed for what they had done to a Roman citizen. And they became very afraid at that point about how they had treated Paul. Verse 30, the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews, he released him from his bonds commanded the chief priests and all the council to appear and, and, and brought Paul down and set him before them. So he had appeared before the citizens, the community, the mob, explained what he was doing, what his work was, who he was, and they just got angrier and wanted to kill him all the more. So now he's going to appear before the council, the Sanhedrin, and he's going to give his defense to the Sanhedrin. What does he say? And what can we learn from what he said here, in verse 6, Paul is before the Sanhedrin, and when he perceived that some of them were Sadducees, other were Pharisees. Kind of a legal, religious council made up of Sadducees, Pharisees, other leaders. And he knew that the Pharisees, Paul said, I am a Pharisee, and I believe in the hope of the resurrection. He knew the Pharisees did believe in the resurrection, the Sadducees did not. And so when he stated that, they began arguing among themselves. It says in verse 7, the assembly was divided. For Sadducees say there is no resurrection and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. Paul brought up this controversial issue. 
And I think all it, it reminds us that he, he simply knew his accusers and he knew the Bible. He knew what the scriptures said. He was familiar, of course. He was a learned man in the scriptures and he leaned on the scriptures. There are times, I think, you know, when we will, in, perhaps in the face of persecution, lean on the scriptures. And we'll see a little bit more later what the Bible has to say about how to do that. But Paul here leaned on the scriptures for strength. And it was an advantage to him by bringing up this issue. Verse 11. But the following light, night, the Lord stood by Paul and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem so you must also bear witness at Rome. You know, that must have been a great comfort to Paul. Because here he was in Jerusalem, but God told him, you're going to make it all the way to Rome. You're going to live at least that long. They may try to kill you here or along the way, but Paul, you're going to have the opportunity to preach in Rome and to testify in Rome. That must have given him some comfort if he believed God, if he had faith in what God said. And that could have been tested greatly because, verse, 30, uh, verse 12, when it was day, some of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under an oath, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who had formed this conspiracy. But as you know the story, Paul learned about it through, I think it was a nephew, his sister's son heard about this ambush. Paul said, tell it to the commander. And the commander of the barracks there um, heard from Paul's sister's son what had been planned to kill Paul. And so what did he do? Verse 22. So the commander let the young man depart and commanded him, tell no one that you reveal these things to me. And he called for two centurions, saying, take 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, and 200 spearmen, and go to Caesarea at the third hour of the night, provide mounts to set Paul on, and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. He had appeared before the citizenry to defend himself and was persecuted. He, was, he had appeared before the Sanhedrin to defend himself, and they were going to kill him. They said, we're not going to eat or drink till we kill Paul. So what happened to them? The Bible doesn't tell us. Did they fast until they died? Did they say, oh, well, I guess, you know, and they finally gave in and ate and drank. It doesn't tell us what happened to them. We don't know. But it would be pretty hard for them to fight through 200 soldiers, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen, you know, 40 of them plotting to kill Paul. Of course, they never did. They either broke their word or they starved to death, and maybe some of both. We simply don't know. But I think when you look back at verse 11, Paul put his faith in what God told him there in verse 11. And I think it's another lesson for us, the importance of faith in God and asking God to help us grow in faith. Remembering we're part of a work and to be able to explain what that work is. All of us are part of it, our children, all of us. And that we need to have faith in God. That may be our only protection at some point in the future. And along the way, we ask God to help us to grow in faith. To learn to lean on the scriptures as Paul did. To know the Bible. And that our children become familiar with the scriptures. And that we're familiar with them. Sure, we read and we forget. But we put there in the first place into our heads and our thoughts. Paul was now about to begin his defense before Felix the governor. It keeps going up to a higher and higher level. We come to Acts chapter 24, and notice the comments here in verse 10. Then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know that you, the governor, have been for many years a judge of this nation, I do more cheerfully answer for myself. Paul is going to summarize his beliefs, which he does. Verse 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept. And there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience without offense toward God and men. It's interesting how Paul kind of summarized his life in a few brief statements. 
and some of his beliefs. There are other statements in here as well. And Paul says in verse 19 and 20, Look, those who are accusing me should be here in person to tell what I've done because I've not done any wrong. Paul knew he hadn't done anything wrong. And he said they should be here in person. Verse 22, But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, apparently Felix was familiar with Christianity. He knew Christians didn't go around starting riots. Christians weren't assassins. The example that he had seen of the Christian community, it says he knew, had more accurate knowledge of the way. That is better than what these Jewish accusers were saying about Paul. That he had seen an example, which again is a reminder for us. You never know where your example, where our example goes. You never know who sees our example and who is affected by our example. When he heard these things, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when Lysias, the commander, comes down, I will make a decision on your case. He didn't make a decision right away, but we read in verse 24, and after some days when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, interesting, he sent for Paul and heard Paul concerning the faith in Christ. He listened to Paul explaining about faith in Christ. Now, as he, Paul, reasoned about righteousness, what is that? Self-control, what is that? And the judgment to come, Felix was afraid and answered, Go away, for now, when I have a convenient time, I will call for you. That convenient time never came. And it's interesting Felix didn't want to do anything about it then. That convenient time never came. But, you know, God's way of life, God's plan of salvation can be a fearful thing to those who won't serve God, but who realize they're going to have to answer to God. Those who believe that someday I'm going to have to answer to God. When they hear about what God's plan really is and about judgment and righteousness, how to live Uh, What kind of, you know, what God expects of us, that can be a fearful thing, as it was here to Felix. We see in verse 27, two years go by, and there's a new governor succeeding Felix named Portius Festus. Two years. And the next step up is that Paul is going to make his defense before Agrippa, the king. And Agrippa, the king, is going to Here, Paul, chapter 26, we read in verse 1, Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself. And once again, verse 6, Now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise our twelve tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Paul goes on to explain how God had called him, why God called him, what he believed, what he was teaching. Uh, We go down to verse 19. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. There was something higher that I was following. But declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem throughout all the region of Judea, and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works fitting of repentance. He's explaining his beliefs. He's not at being obnoxious. He's not attacking anybody else. Here's what I believe. Here's what God has called me to do. Here's what I've been doing. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. They tried to kill Paul. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that Christ would suffer, He would be the first to rise from the dead, would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. So again, Paul just states his beliefs. Doesn't attack anybody. Um, I think, again, it's a powerful example for us to be able to clearly explain our beliefs. But where does that come from? Does it come from memorizing scriptures or memorizing phrases? No, it comes from living it. You can explain your beliefs clearly because you're living them. We, We live what we're convicted of Uh, that we find in the scriptures. We live the way we live because we have convictions. 
God has taught us. We find it in the scriptures. We've put it to the test. And we don't have to memorize certain things. We can state our beliefs because we live them. They're part of our conviction, if they are. We live a certain way. Paul was teaching from his convictions. And I think, again, it's a powerful example for us to be able to do likewise. Well, finally, Paul is off to Rome. He's going to appear before Caesar. He claims the right. I'm a Roman citizen. I want to appeal to Caesar. And so he's in Rome. The book of Acts concludes here in Acts 28, verse 30 and 31. Paul is prepared to appear before Caesar. What happens? Acts 28, verse 30. Then Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house, received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And then the book ends. And that's the last we hear about what Paul you know, was doing there in Rome, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. How would you do that? I mean, if you had the opportunity, here Paul had an opportunity to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God. What would you say? How would you do it? When somebody asks you, well, what do you believe about the kingdom? It's interesting, the uh, <clears throat> latest Life, Hope, and Truth presents by Mr. Gary Black is about the kingdom of God. He does a very good job with, with the third program that has just aired. Uh, very well done. How would you preach the kingdom of God? Paul went to the highest court of appeal uh, because of persecution. And every step of the way, God intervened clearly for him and brought him to Rome. He knew there would be persecution at each level, and he was prepared. He proclaimed his beliefs. You know, how did Paul prepare? Wasn't it the same way that you're preparing? The same way that we're preparing? Paul prepared for this. Certainly he studied the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. But he also prepared by living this way of life, walking by faith, being prepared to give an answer. Isn't that how we're trying to prepare? By walking by faith daily and by preparing to give an answer, being familiar with the scriptures, <clears throat> Paul clearly stood firmly, strongly convicted of his beliefs. He wasn't going to compromise. He, you know, he wasn't going to deny what he believed. <clears throat> Paul was firm in his beliefs. He had proven them. He had been living them. And he wasn't about to back away from what he believed. And I think here in, in these few chapters is a kind of a tutorial for us about how to be prepared to face persecution as Paul did. Some very powerful lessons in these few chapters. It's hard, to, it's hard for me to put myself in Paul's shoes and try to imagine, you know, what it would be like to go through the kind of persecution he suffered. But there are lessons all along the way for us. And prime among them is the importance of standing firm and being convicted. Either we have convictions or we don't about why we're living the way we're living. Paul could speak from conviction, and he stood firm. Can you imagine Paul when <clears throat> facing persecution or before Felix or before Caesar when asked about why he was being accused? Can you imagine Paul saying, well, my church says I am supposed to or my church says I need to, you know, that just wouldn't cut it, would it? Uh, in the end time, the church may be discredited, certainly will be, and hated. There may be no functioning body at that time for a period of time or not functioning the way it functions today. We may not be able to say my church says you know, the mistake that some parents made through the years, teaching their children, oh, you can't do that on the Sabbath because the church says. Instead of teaching their children, you know, this is what we believe, this is what the Bible says, this is what God says, and God has taught us, and God holds us accountable for teaching you, and, you know, these, we believe these things. Can you imagine Paul saying, well, I do this because my church says. And that, where would be the conviction in that? And so Paul's convictions were very strong about that way of life way of life that he proved and lived. And it's the same thing we're doing in our lives as well. In 1 Peter 3, kind of a summary of some of our 
responsibilities in preparing, you know, for persecution. However, whenever it may come, in 1 Peter 3, in verse 14, 15, and 16, there's really a list of, kind of a list of five questions or five statements, five elements in part of our preparing for that time. 1 Peter 3, verse 14, 15, and 16. But even if, even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you are blessed. Do not be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. So we're told, don't be afraid, and don't worry. Don't spend a lot of time worrying about what's going to happen next. Don't be troubled or worried, we're told. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. There are some instructions. Sanctify God in your hearts. That's talking about what is our personal relationship like with God. Do we have a strong personal relationship with God? It comes from maintaining that relationship through prayer, through study. Do we have that? That's what it's talking about, sanctifying, making holy and special our relationship with God. It goes on to say, and be always ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That is, be prepared to give an answer coming from what we live and what we believe and what we're convicted about. And then he says, verse 16, having a good conscience, that when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. Have a clear conscience. Repent when we sin. Go to God when we, and ask God for forgiveness when we should. Having a clear conscience. I mean, we, There's a list of five things right there that God expects us to be doing as we prepare for that time, the end of the age, whether it comes in our lifetime or the next lifetime or the one after that. So God wants us to be convicted and to follow these instructions as well. In John chapter 14, there's, I want to share with you just three scriptures here, some very encouraging reminders about that time of persecution. <clears throat> when we live the truth of God out of conviction and by choice, we've chosen this way of life. Nobody is, you know, I never baptized somebody that I came to their front door, knocked on the door, they let me in, and I took ropes and chains, tied them up and said, I'm going to baptize you whether you like it or not. Never did that. You know, we live this way of life by choice. And when we live the truths of God out of conviction and because we've chosen to, we don't really need to worry about what we may forget and what scriptures we may have forgotten. We can defend our beliefs from conviction and from how we live. But here are some encouraging reminders. John 14, verse 26, Christ said, He who does... Uh, Verse 26, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, which the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. There's a promise about things that we've put into our mind, the word of God. When needed, God's Spirit can bring them to our remembrance. Matthew 10, verse 19 and 20. Matthew 10, verse 19 and 20. Notice what Christ said here. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak. For it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father who speaks or which speaks in you. In the context of the persecution that is described before and after those two verses. He said, it is not you, but the Spirit. It will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. We certainly need to study God's word, put it in our mind, have it there. We may not remember and turn to, you know, book and verse, you know, per se, but we know the truth of God, and God can call it to our mind when we need it. Luke 21, Luke 21 and verse 12 through 15. Luke 21, verse 12 through 15, God can work through us as he chooses through his spirit as we have faith in God. Luke 21, verse 12 through 15, but before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. You will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. 
but it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. Maybe not everybody, but some who are going to be persecuted in this way, it says it will become an occasion for testimony. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you will answer. For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. That's a comforting thought to know that as we put our faith in God and trust in God and walk with God in our life and walk down this path continually, that God may use us in this way, an occasion for testimony, and give us wisdom that nobody's going to be able to gainsay. Yes, we need to put God's word in our minds. We are told to study diligently the word of God, but we also have these promises from God and this help. You know, sometimes we say, you know, I pray, but I'm weak on studying. I can't remember what I've read. I can't remember scriptures, but study it anyway. Read it anyway. Read it slowly. Read the Bible slowly. Continue to study it. Read it. Put it in your mind, and God can use that when the time comes and when it's needed. I want to conclude with these two promises from God in Isaiah. Isaiah 25 and Isaiah 26. In the face of coming persecution, it is important to be dedicated to the word of God, to the work of God, convicted in our beliefs, proving them. Isaiah 25, there is this promise from God in verse 9. And it will be said in that day, time surrounding that time of trouble and leading up to the return of Christ. And the world seems to be more and more in turmoil this time. It will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. There may be trials and tribulation along the way, but this is what we keep in mind. This is what we keep looking forward to. In Isaiah 26, verse 3, You will keep him or her in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Certainly Paul's example was one of his mind stayed on God. And there is a peace of mind that comes from that. <clears throat> peace that comes from having our mind fixed on God in faith. Trials and persecutions are not pleasant subjects to think about. I didn't want to, you know, don't want to ruin your Sabbath with a sermon about persecution. But yet, there's also encouragement from God. And we know that help from God and strength from God and promises from God that there is a time coming that we all look forward to. There may be persecution, trials and persecution, and not pleasant to talk about. But we really don't have time to worry or fret about coming trials and persecution because of walking the Christian path. That's what we've chosen to do to walk this way of life. God tells us to be prepared. We do have time to prepare. We don't know how many years any of us have to prepare, but we do have time to prepare. And in the life of Paul and in these examples, we learn some important lessons. So that time will come. Uh, persecution and promises from God. We can count on both.